welcome everybody. Christopher Wolf is our speaker today. Christopher lives in Port Moody and volunteers at the PACE Society, which is a Vancouver downtown Eastside service organization that serves trans folks. Christopher is a recipient of a chair in Transgender Studies Community Fellowship and plans to share the results of their research with community organizations, individuals, and of course with us. Uh, the title is Trans Artists, How and Why of Their Creative Practices. And I've got a short abstract and then you'll hear the, the details in a moment. Uh, so, uh, Christopher says, I believe that we as transgender, non-binary, and two-spirit people can transform our experiences into art and thereby create community and awareness for issues unique to our lives. Being a transgender writer, Christopher is very interested in how other trans artists, especially writers, establish a creative practice. Christopher has seen firsthand the importance of a creative art practice, which is crucial both for individual well-being as well as a way to raise awareness for trans-related issues. So Christopher's research at the Transgender Archives at UVic will focus on how trans artists of all ages have used their creative art practices to express themselves and their gender identity. He's especially interested in how various artists have spoken and written about their work in order to foster belonging and create community with other trans folks. By looking at materials from the Transgender Archives documenting these processes, Christopher hopes to explore how creative art practices have supported individual and collective self-care among transgender folks working as creative artists. So I turn it over, Christopher Wolf. Um, thank you, Aaron, for the introduction and the welcome. And also thank you, Michael, for um, setting everything up perfectly. So um, technology, it's working, um, which is important. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming to this talk. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to do research at the archives um, and um, not just uh, focusing, uh, not just uh, in the focus of my research, but just uh, to get those glimpses into transgender history and transgender culture. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. So as um, Aaron mentioned, um, I am a writer myself. Um, I do write about trans issues in my work. I also um, occasionally give writing, creative writing workshops to trans and non-binary youth. So um, in, especially in the workshops, I've seen how um, important it is um, for, to have a creative practice, um, has many good reasons to have one. And um, from my own personal experience, I find that there's an extremely high correlation between people who are trans and people who are working creatively. So um, yeah, I got really interested in exploring that more. Um, so what I've personally found, um, uh, and Aaron already um, sort of like mentioned that by reading my abstract, I uh, believe that having a creative practice um, does contribute to individual well-being. It um, can raise awareness for trans-related issues. It does allow you to um, express yourself and your gender identity and ultimately does foster belonging and create community with other trans folks. So in summary, um, having a creative practice does support individual and collective self-care. Um, it's really interesting at this moment in time that um, trans art and trans artists are becoming much more visible to the point of um, being sort of in, in official in institutions created. So um, there has been for a couple of years what is called the Museum of Trans History and Art, short mother, um, and um, they, are, um, they don't have a permanent location yet, but um, they have um, exhibitions. Um, so one of the exhibitions was called Transgender History in 99 Objects, which has been um, shown in several locations since 2015. And actually was, um, I'm sure some of you have seen it, was here at the beginning of 2018 in the Legacy Gallery. Um, so Mother says that they're dedicated to moving the history and art of transgender people to the center of public life. They're committed to developing a rust exhibition and programming schedule that will enrich the transgender mythos, both by exhibiting works by living artists and by honoring the heroes and transistors who have come before. There's also something called Gender Unbound, which is a trans and intersex art festival in um, Austin, Texas, which has been in existence um, since 2016. It's an annual 
uh, art fest um, dedicated exclusively to trans and intersex artists and art. So um, part of their statement is that it is created by and for trans and intersex community members and the purpose is to center and amplify the voice, uh, our voices as the agents of our own stories by illustrating our own visions, speaking in our own words, and dancing to our own music, we can break through stereotypes and show off the diversity of our best, most talented selves. So you see there's, um, you have a museum essentially for trans art, you have an actual art festival for trans and intersex art. So there is um, the slow sort of creation of actual uh, official institutions for trans art. Um, these are some examples of the research I've done so far. These are some collections or like showcases of trans art. The first one is something from a magazine called Original Plumbing, which is dedicated to trans male culture. And um, this magazine has been in existence since 2009. And um, this particular art issue showcased um, several um, trans masculine artists. Um, the also, uh, original plumbing also has regular interviews with um, trans artists and other issues. So that's uh, one publication that regularly showcases trans artists. Then um, the second one is, a, is um, actually originally a podcast by Nia King. Um, the podcast is called We Want the Airwaves and it's been in existence since 2013. Um, and uh, all of the interviews that Nia King has done have been transcribed. So there's, um, this is the picture of the first volume. There's actually two volumes now, and the third one is coming out, I believe, this year, which is um, focusing, um, as the title says, on the art of queer and trans artists of color. So um, also um, gave me a lot of material for my research into trans art and trans artists. And um, the last example is a photography magazine called Aperture, um, which did an issue called Future Gender, which was uh, guest edited by Zachary Drucker, mm -hmm. a trans artist that I'm going to be talking about later a bit more. Um, and they basically um, looked at how trans and gender non-conforming individuals use photography specifically as an art form to imagine new expressions of social and personal identity. So there's actually a lot of like magazines, books out there that do showcase, showcase transgender art. Um, same goes for writing by trans writers. There's actually a lot of collections in various genres out now. So you have um, something like Troubling the Line, which um, focuses on trans and gender queer poetry and poetics. Um, you have something like the collection, which um, is short fiction. Meanwhile, Elsewhere is a great um, volume of speculative fiction by uh, trans writers. Um, Nerve Endings is one uh, of actually many examples of trans erotica. And there even was, um, there were two conferences um, called Writing Trans Genres in Winnipeg um, a couple years ago, which um, exclusively focused on trans writing from a more like theoretical scholarly approach. So I'm gonna spend most of my talk, uh, the rest of my talk, introducing different trans artists and talk about the reasoning behind their creative practice. Um, and this is mostly drawn, as you can already see, on their own words and on the sources that I've just mentioned. Obviously, there's still a lot more to explore in terms of artists and sources. This is why I'm doing research at the archives. And I should also mention that similar to Mother's Approach, um, I have a pretty broad definition of what constitutes a trans artist. So I do include gender non-conforming, gender queer, non-binary, and two-spirit artists. Um, and I do also consciously strive for diversity in my examples, which you'll hopefully see, because unfortunately it is the fact that even within the trans community, certain identities tend to be underrepresentative when it comes to visibility and also publicity. So the first artist I'd like to talk about is Toy Scott. Um, Toy Scott is a non-binary spoken word artist and author. They are also uh, an organizer and community activist, and they have written and self-published poems, plays, and novels. So Toy says, I write not for entertainment's sake, but to help those who have been oppressed and who have felt invalidated, misunderstood, silenced, and voiceless to know and be in their power. 
Gathering and sharing our stories, expressing our voices through art, is and always has been necessary for queer and trans people of color survival. Art can raise awareness about oppression, move people to action, and help us envision the better world we are working towards. <laughs> so, as you can see from Toy's statements, they do consider their creative art practice to be directly connected and expressive of their political activism. Specifically, they are using their creativity to support folks to help them tell their stories and to advocate for change. And this particular concept of connecting art and art activism is something called artivism. And Toy Scott is actually one of several trans artists who subscribes to artivism as a practice. But they do also emphasize how their practice collects and archives the history of trans and queer people, particularly from an intersectional lens. And that's also something we're going to see pop up over and over again with different trans artists. Um, the next artist is Van Binfa. Van is a queer Ch Chilean trans man and uh, the founder and facilitator of Soy Kin Soy, a trans empowerment collective, which is a support resource group for trans people of all colors in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And uh, Van, as you can see, primarily works on web comics. Um, the site is called um, Transtastic. And the, the webcomics center his experience as a Latino trans man. And Van says, I'm all about being more positive about being trans and spreading that out there, that you can totally love your trans body or you can overcome things without having to focus on what we've been told. There's a weird divide between what we value as real work and a lot of what we do. But then again, a lot of the things that I do are half for myself because I need to do it and half for other people because I feel there's a need for it out there. So Van's creative practice clearly focuses on celebration and affirmation of the trans experience. And it is both a self-care measure and support for, other, for others in the trans community. So um, here, the individual and the collective self-care um, come nicely together in his statement. Um, Fabian Romero is my next artist. Fabian is a two-spirit poet, filmmaker, and artist, and they co-founded and participated in several writing and performance groups. And um, Fabian says, I don't think my spirit can survive if I do anything other than create. I feel if I don't create, I won't be myself. I also feel that there are so many hurtful representations out there, and I would love to at least have a chance to do something that isn't so hurtful. I would love to have art and writing and all kinds of creative responses to that to challenge and even change it. My hope is that my art will change some part of the world. I come offering what knowledge and experiences I have to help people see things even a little differently. So Fabian does, um, writes poetry and also does filmmaking. Um, and so the statements about their creative practice are, are very directly about art as um, personal spiritual survival something that the other artists sort of have in, in, indirectly touched upon. But at the si same time, that feeling of creativity as survival is obviously tied to other people, to the world. And here we see that concept of artivism as the combination of art and activism pop up again, to have a creative practice in order to affect political change, specifically as to the representation of trans folks. Um, I'm hopefully getting the name pronunciation right. It's really, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, Ray Sinari, um, also known just as Trans Painter, um, is a transgender non-binary art artist from Portland, Oregon. And his most recent portrait series, Transcend, celebrates transgender and non-binary individuals throughout the world who are living their lives openly, choosing integrity over safety. Transcend is a direct response to uh, the oppression experienced by trans people transgender people as they reclaim space, also literally in larger than life portraits. So um, I have chosen one example. Um, the person pictured in this painting is Alok Manon, a gender non-conforming writer, performance artist, and educator. Um, so uh, Reyes says, my personal goal as an artist is to help tell trans stories. I want to garner respect for the trans community and I believe that respect comes from understanding. Seeing our diverse beauty represented in fine artwork makes us feel less alone. B 
We need spaces to be inspired by images of our defiant, resilient, and joyful trans and non-binary fa family. So um, these words are actually taken from something that Ray wrote, which is called the Transgender Art Manifesto, um, which they have on their website. Um, so we see once again the focus on the trans community here as Ray creates in order to help others tell their stories so that the community at large can find truthful representations of themselves. There's also the mention of connecting to a larger uh, cisgender audience to increase and improve support for trans folks. And that's a little bit different from the previous statements that we've seen because those focus more on a connection for and within the trans community, whereas Ray specifically also wants to reach out to a cis audience to yeah, um, improve understanding of trans folks. And I would say uh, a similar mission is someone that I'm pretty sure you know, um, one of the most well-known trans artists out there, Janet Mock. Um, she's primarily known for her memoir, Redefining Realness. Um, and she recently has worked as a writer, director, and producer on the TV show Pose, which um, already has made uh, TV history because the first season featured the largest cast of um, trans actors ever. So Janet Mock says, it's not enough just to tell your story. How do you engage with people? How do you find people who want to continue engaging with you beyond the story? For me, it was to continue telling stories to write when necessary. It is my craft and my work and my stories that stand before me and lead the way. And not so much this idea of being this activist or this advocate who's out there representing all these people. Instead, it's the story that tends to then represent or shed light on people whose voices aren't heard. People will see the story of my life as more important than the craft that it took to make that story come to life and communicate it in a way that makes someone feel entertained and also informs them of a different kind of human experience. So it's clear from Mark's statements that she's very much about creativity and the craft of writing and the work that goes into creating um, art. It's also, to me, very interesting that she, she sort of um, refuses the label of activist and wants to separate that from her work. So she sees her work as um, different from herself as a person in a way. Um, um, she, she does very much say that the work is about representation and visibility, but she, also, she does say that a work of art can essentially be more representative for the trans experience than the person who created it. Um, a very different statement comes from the aforementioned um, Original Plumbing art issue. Um, Rocco Cayetas and Amos Mack are the editors of Original Plumbing and um, the statement was taken from the editorial of the art issue. And they say, for those of us who are part of a marginalized community, the artist is also a documentarian. They are the messengers of hope, the illuminators, the mouthpiece of the revolution. They provide context, humor and visibility. It is almost impossible to translate our surroundings or climate with anything but art. Trans people making art is a revolutionary act. So uh, quite different. So obviously they read, um, they read trans art as a lot more political. Um, trans art is considered here inherently subversive as its mere existence challenges cisgender nor uh, norms. Mac, who is a photographer and writer, and Callado, who is a poet, musician, and speaker, obviously, again, create very much in the spirit of artivism. And one of the artists featured in this issue, art issue, was Xavier Chapani, um, who makes some very interesting comments, not just about creating trans art, but being perceived as a trans artist. So Xavier says, I feel like it is important to give voice to those who may not always be represented in mainstream media. I definitely struggled finding my voice as a trans artist. I was having issues with being labeled, but also felt it important to represent myself honestly. So Chopani, who draws and paints, points out that it can be inhibiting to the creative practice to be labeled as a trans artist only. But he also found that it was important for his self-understanding to be known as a trans artist. So connecting with this focus on creating, again, representation of marginalized voices, Something we've now seen is kind of a common theme for a lot of trans artists. Um, Xavier's creative practice is um, not just representation of other people, but also self-representation. The next artist is Ethan X. Parker, 
an illustrator and comic artist. And Ethan says, I create art to support and empower queer and trans people that I see slugging through the muck on a daily basis. I create for the front runners who are out there putting their careers and lives on the line so that the trans community can get the access we need to survive. I create for the people who can't be visible with their trans identity because it's not safe. I create art for my people who don't often get a voice in the greater conversations about transgender rights through black trans women and trans women of color literally paved the way at the path toward queer and trans liberation. So Ethan also names representation, specifically of trans people of color, as the reason they create. Um, and this continued theme of art for the community is something that does seem emphasized, particularly by artists with intersecting identities, like for example, trans and being a person of color. Um, so the marginalization that is also happening within the trans community seems to push artists like Parker to center their practice on those who are less visible or rendered invisible, despite their historic achievements for all LGBTQ plus folks. Um, so art is oftentimes avant-garde in that it rebels against the status quo, and K KC Chromatix is a non-binary trans artist in that tra tradition. Um, KC says, leveraging my curiosity against forms and concepts that are the way things are, or common sense, or natural, or most generally speaking normal, is something that interests them. As a trans pe person, I feel like my artwork has an important role in humanizing this experience for people who don't understand us. We show the flip sides, the alternatives, the undercurrents, the overlooked. We ask questions and when we answer, it might not be simple. So with his practice, he challenges cultural and social norms, he says, questioning and breaking up norms. But he mentions also that despite the sort of radicality of his practice, he believes that it does enable a connection with non-trans audiences to foster more understanding for trans people. Uh, Mike Abizan, um, again, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, is a visual artist. And um, when I looked at their website, they have a big headline there that says, making social change look irresistible, mm -hmm. which is inspired by a quote from the African-American activist, Tony K. Bambara, who said, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. So Mike has says, I create art as a practice of love and solidarity with racial justice movements. Art helps us remember that the impossible is possible and imagine the world we need to build together. So from the statement, it's obvious that once again, artivism is at the heart of their practice. However, their words zero in more on the emotional aspect, I would say, of their creativity, using words like love to describe both their subjects and audience and building on a more optimistic and practical outlook. Changing the world requires solidarity and bringing people together to do the actual work. But Micah's art is also a historical one, as you can see, documenting the work of trans sisters like Marsha P. Johnson. And they also have done a lot of artwork um, about current leaders from, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, a similar approach is that of Rekha Aoki. Um, Rekha is a writer and performer best known for her book, Seasonal Velocities, which won a Lambda Award. And Rekha says, we have to not only grow as organizers looking for useful things to keep furthering the queer and trans agenda, but also nurture artists who are also furthering the queer and trans agenda. Um, she, so she mentioned the, mentions the importance of trans artists within the fight for queer and trans rights, and she equals the work of artists to that of community organizers. Rekha has also spoken about the fact that it can be challenging to explore the complications of writing for community while satisfying one's own creative goals. So a bit similar to Xavier Shipani, there is a sort of search for balance for a trans artist between being true to their own vision, but also feeling that they are creating for and with, within a larger trans community. Um, I made two slides for Vivek Shreya because she's done so much work and I wanted to give like a quick um, representation of that. So. Vivek Shreya has worked uh, in many genres. She's pretty well known, I would say, um, especially in Canada now as a Canadian trans artist. Um, she's done music, she's done poetry, um, 
She has done installation art, and her latest work is a nonfiction book called I'm Afraid of Men, which uh, I think came just out. Um, and um, she, like other uh, trans artists um, of color, she says, my own art production must be tied to supporting the creation and dissemination of younger artists of color. Teaching feels like an extension of my art practice as I can infuse politics I care about into my classroom, not unlike what I do in my art. She also says that I hope my work is a small form of activism. And she also says about her album, Part-Time Woman, that she was really excited to make songs that, of course, any listener could connect to, but the album is dedicated to anyone who's been misgendered or anyone who's had their femininity questioned. For me, it was really wanting to create something that trans and gender non-performing listeners could hear parts of themselves in. So her art is dedicated to uplifting other trans folks who are in need of a voice, uh, but also relating that to political activism again. Um, and I would say where Viva Shreya differs from the examples I've previously presented is that she also connects it with mentoring and teaching other emerging artists. So, not just creating a community with her audience, but also with other creatives and viewing that as an intrinsic part of her creative practice. Um, the next artists are, um, I've presented them together because they do frequently co co collaborate, uh, Zachary Drucker and Rise Ernst. So um, Zachary does performance and photography mostly, uh, whereas Rise Ernst is um, also photography, um, but also a filmmaker. and. Um, they both are, um, are, I would say, almost a, an equal level when it comes to fame compared to Vivek Shreya because they both have been part of the international art, art world for some time. And their work has essentially been extended into the mainstream TV world because they both um, are serving as producers and directors on the TV show Transparent. And as I said, they both um, have separate creative practices, but they also frequently collaborate, particularly on a relationship. Um, which is a photography um, installation project that documents their six-year romantic relationships while they were both transitioning. So Zachary says, I have continued to use photography as a way to verify my existence and to see myself, my relationships, my evolution. And they both said about relationship that if our greatest artwork is the way that we live our lives, then a relationship is the ultimate collaboration and that they made these photography, photographs to record that love is possible between two trans people who feared that they would never be loved again after transition. We made these photographs to imagine a world beyond the binary, to record a type that hadn't yet been visualized. So they both speak to how this and other art serves for them as a way to documenting their lives as trans people, to sort of dream themselves into existence together as a couple. And this again echoes the work of arts like Chopani in that the creation of art is both representation of themselves <coughs> as subjects and also a self-representation of them as trans artists. Uh, the last artist I'd like to talk about is Jess T. Yugen, um, who's also a photographer and in her first publication, Every Breath We Through, which came out in 2015, she documented various gender variant uh, people from all stages of life. And Jess said, I was immediately stru struck by my ability to speak about the issues that were important to me so poignantly through photography. She said that she was recognizing something in my subjects that I also perceive or desire in myself, and that she was trying to figure out who I was in relation to other people and who I could connect with in a meaningful and profound way. And that she does hope that my work on some level has a social and political effect. However, at the end of the day, I make photographs, and these photographs are informed by my own subject, subjective experience as well as subjective aesthetics. So she was clearly motivated by, sim motivated by similar ideas as Drucker and Ernst by relating her subject's experience to her own, and I should mention that her project also features some self-portraits, so she herself is also a, su a subject in her art. It is also interesting that while she acknowledging that she creates with sort of an artivist aspect, so does say she wants to have it some social and political effect, um, that she doesn't want to speak for anybody, and that's kind of similar to Janet Mock. And it seems there is a hesitancy from some artists to be like a personal representative for the larger community, despite them encouraging their work to be viewed that way. And uh, Justy Dugan has continued to center her work on the LGBT 
LGBTQ plus community and together with her partner, Vanessa Fabre, she has just published a body of work called To Survive on the Shore, which is centering aging and elder trans and gender non-conforming folks. And quoted in an article in the New York Times, Dugan said that we wanted to create representations of older transgender people and gender non-conforming people to both capture their stories preserve their history, record something of the activism that they had been a part of. But we also wanted to create younger, uh, create representations for younger transgender people to see a roadmap for what their life could look like, to see people aging and living these complicated and exciting and robust lives in many cases. Um, so it was, it, that goes back to representation and this time it's sort of like an inter-community connection to yes, show showcase the lives of elder trans folks and raising their visibility within the trans community for younger people to essentially create role models for younger trans people. Um, so with this not exhaustive list, obviously very subjective list of trans artists working today, um, a list like I said, they could be extended indefinitely. Um, I would say that we can see that some shared functions of the creative practice of trans artists are political activism, which I've mentioned is also called artivism, representation and agency for trans folks, a connection to the larger trans community, a documentation of the trans experience, also in a historical sense, and also the subversion of sort of cis um, cultural norms of gender. And I would like to end my presentation with uh, two um, sort of contradictory quotes <laughs> from two other trans artists. So the first is from Eusenia Lewis, um, who says, there can be no art without activism and no activism without art. So um, it says that that cannot be separated. And I think that I've shown that that is actually true for a great number of trans artists and their creative practice. However, it's not true for everybody. And uh, my last example is from uh, Ivan Coyote, a musician and performer who wrote an op-ed for The Guardian a while ago, where they actually talked about not wanting to confuse their art with activism. Um, Ivan Coyote said, what if one day we all just got to answer intelligent and well thought out questions about our creative ideas or our dreams or new projects? What would I be free to write and talk about if I wasn't always expected to change the world? What if I was just allowed to live and create in it? So. Um, in that op-ed, Coyote specifically um, said that they were tired of being asked about trans politics in every interview um, and that their art wasn't always in just about being trans. And we've heard some similar comments in terms of like not wanting to be a representative always from Janet Mock and also Jess Dugan. Um, so in summary, while political activism does play a large role in the creation of artworks by trans artists, it's not part of every artist's practice. But I would say that themes like community, connection, and representation definitely are. Thank you.